thank you once again, everybody, for joining. My name is Andy Fight. I'm president of marketing with Aqua Security, and joining me today is Liz Rice, our vice president of open source software. Hi, Liz. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so this is part of the CubeSec Enterprise online webinar series. This is uh, num week number four. Uh, of what is now scheduled to be 11 weeks. So for those of, for those of you who signed in early, we'll be sending out three more additional weeks the, for you to register for. But uh, this came about when it was not clear what was going to happen with, with KubeCon Amsterdam. And now we all know it will be a virtual event in August, and we look forward to seeing everybody there. But in the past three KubeCons, we have run an event called CubeSec Enterprise Summit where customers have come to talk about the challenge of deploying Kubernetes in enterprise production environments. And we had a bunch of speakers signed up to do Amsterdam, planning to go. And of course, uh, thanks to this global pandemic, we had to make some changes. But uh, we took mo many of those speakers who were willing to do this as a webinar series and, and slotted them week by week. Um, this week is, is Liz's turn to talk about her new book. So Liz, in addition to running open source software for Aqua, you're also an, uh, an established author with a brand new book. <laughs> yep, I am. We will come to that shortly. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, uh, let's go over some of the housekeeping issues and then we'll, we'll let Liz kick this off. So if you do have questions today, because we have a lot of people on, uh, great turnout today, we will be doing questions uh, via your go to webinar panel. So if you put a question in there, we will try and take some throughout if they seem like they're really relevant to the current conversation. Otherwise, we'll try and take some at the end. And if we don't get to your question, we will reply via email. We will make a copy of the slides available after the event, and we are interested in your feedback as well. So on what was good about today, other things. We will be doing some polls today as well. So we ask you, for those of you who are here live, not viewing this as a, uh, an archive, you're here today, you're live. Um, we will be polling, and we'd love to see your answers. And for those of you who are watching this on demand now, uh, you'll see everybody's answer. Think about your own response as we go through. So uh, with that, let me... Uh, turn it over to Liz and to talk about the her new book and some of the key findings in that and uh, and share that with you today. So go ahead, Liz. Wonderful. Thanks, Andy. And hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming and joining us today. Um, I would really like this to be as interactive as we can make it. So as Andy says, there are going to be lots of polls during this talk to, to help you get involved. And um, yeah, please do ask questions and we can try to take them either as we go along or, or we'll answer them at the end, as Andy says. So I look after the open source engineering team here at Aqua Security. And uh, as Andy mentioned, I am also an author. I recently published uh, the, this book called Container Security. Uh, published by O'Reilly. If you're watching this live, you should find an electronic copy of the book in the handout. Uh, and if you're not watching live, you can download an electronic copy from Aqua's website for just in exchange for your contact details. And Mary and did course, ask me to make one point, Liz. The handout, if you do click on the handout in your handouts tab, it will open in a separate browser window. You might not notice it. Some people have opened multiples and they find them all later. So look for that separate window to pop up if you do download the handout. <laughs> OK, great. And of course, if you want a physical copy, it's available in your favorite bookstore. So um, go and order it from your local bookstore. So. In the book, right at the end, I have an appendix that's, well, it's called the security checklist, and it covers a list of 28 questions that you should ask yourself uh, to help you establish whether there are things you could do to improve the security of your deployment. Now, in today's webinar, we don't have time to cover all of those questions and all of those checklist items. But I thought I would highlight a few of my favorite and perhaps the most important questions uh, and we'll concentrate on those and explain them today. So this, we're going to consider six questions and they spread across the whole container lifecycle from the point where you're building container images right through to where they're running live in your deployment. 
And by thinking about these questions, you might leave this talk today with some actions that you can take to make your own deployments more secure. So for each of these six checklist items, I'm going to ask a question. We're going to open a poll to get you thinking about that question. And why not? Let's get started. So uh, let's bring up the first of those questions, which is about the build machines. Are you running your builds separately from your production cluster? Are you running builds on different machines or virtual machines? It looks like people are, are overwhelmingly on the right side of this one, Liz. <laughs> That's good. That is good to see. Yes, we're seeing the numbers are changing as your votes are coming in, but it's looking very much as though your uh, your builds are running separately from production, which is very good news, as we will explain shortly. Looks like pretty much everyone has voted, so nearly everyone has. I think we have a pretty significant uh, view there that uh, the vast majority of you are. Well, congratulations, you're running your build separately. And of course, let's why is that important, Liz? <laughs> well, let's, let's just consider exactly why that is important. So if your build processes are on the same machine as your application workloads, they're sharing a kernel. And if anything were able to escape the build process onto the host, it would have access to those applications. And remember that Docker files that we're typically using to, uh, uh, my mouse isn't working, let's see, there we go, yes. If your Docker files contain instructions to run basically arbitrary code, you can have any instruction here that's gonna run during the build. So if someone manages to compromise your Docker file and compromise those build instructions, they can get the build to do pretty much anything they want it to. Now, this is even more serious if you are using a Docker build process that uses the Docker socket because the Docker socket is essentially root access to the host. So my main advice here for the you know, small percentage of you, around 10% that either don't know or may be running your builds in your production cluster, the safest thing to do is keep your builds entirely separate. Now, it is possible to run builds in your production environment in a safe way. So I have caveated this, that if you know what you're doing, you can run your builds in production. You could use, for example, uh, sandboxing like Gvisor. Uh, you could potentially be scheduling your build jobs to specific nodes in the cluster where applications don't run. Uh, you could also be using rootless build processes, things like Umochi or Builder or um, the Docker build kit in rootless mode, all these things that basically don't require a Docker daemon. So there are ways you could safely do this, but it's probably safest unless you've thought very carefully about it to just keep your builds separate from your production cluster. And the good news is it seems like most of you are doing that, so we're off to a flying start. That's good. All right. So the next question is going to consider the images that get built. So let's get ready for the next poll. In your container image builds, is all executable code added to the container image at build time? So uh, if you have containers that update themselves when they start running or that load extra executables, you need to answer no to this question. Okay, lots of answers coming in. This isn't quite as clear cut, but it looks like we have a pretty large majority who are keeping their, all their executables added at build time. Okay, I think we've got the majority of answers now, so let's take a look at those results. Okay, so around two thirds of you are keeping your, uh, or adding all your executable code to the container images during the build. A significant number of you are not sure, so uh, let's, let's explain a little bit more about what we mean here. So, once you build your application container image, 
it's a really good idea to scan it for known vulnerabilities that might exist in the packages or language dependencies inside that container image. If you're not already scanning your images, do please start doing that. There's lots of free and open source tools available for vulnerability scanning, including our own Trivi. It's entirely free, so just go ahead and use that. Scanning your images lets you know if your containers have known vulnerabilities that attackers could exploit. Um, so you want to scan basically to have some confidence that you're not running something like Shellshock or Heartbleed or any one of thousands of other known issues. So then you go and run your container uh, instantiated from that container image in the cloud and you want to know that all the executables in that running container were scanned and that they have been deemed safe to run. If you do something that adds additional code to your image, maybe using package managers like apt or yum to add or update packages, or maybe you're using curl or FTP or git clone or anything else to grab additional code that then can be run inside that container, well, any of that additional code hasn't been scanned and you really don't have any way of knowing that it's safe to run. So best practice is to only run code in your containers that was present when you built the image. We call this treating our containers as immutable. And a change to a running container is sometimes called drift. And we're going to come back to the idea of container drift later on. But so for Liz, now, quick question. On... Um, I mean, well, you know, obviously it gives you some flexibility to modify a running container. I guess that's one of the things people are looking for. Is there ever a good reason to do this? Or really, you would say, if you need to make a change, go back to that app, build it fresh, and, and never do this? Yeah, I, I'm sure you know people will have some kind of edge case where it is critical but for you know 99.9 percent .9 of normal applications there's no reason to do this it's much better idea to rebuild your container image and redeploy with the updated code great yeah thanks it seems like most of our attendees are already doing that but those of you who maybe aren't or uh you know maybe need to go and check this is, it's all really about scanning and having confidence in the code that you're running. Okay, so when we run our containers, we're running, the, the container is defined by a container image and then it's configured with flags, maybe Docker parameters or the pod spec YAML in Kubernetes. Are you, avoiding using the dash dash privileged flag. That's our next poll, if we can open that up. Okay. So I've tried to phrase all these questions so that if you're doing the right thing, you're answering yes. So no, avoiding don't tell that people that. Now they're gonna answer yes to every poll, even <laughs> if they aren't doing the right thing. So they don't want to be, be they don't want to admit it. <laughs> okay, uh, well. answers coming in thick and fast. It looks pretty similar numbers to the last last one. So I think we've got enough. We could probably close now. It so is again, interesting that a fair sorry. number of people don't know here, right? You know, so again, it may be that people who are in development aren't sure how the operations people are deploying it, or uh, what do you think is going on there? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think uh, it would behoove everyone to make sure that we're not running our containers with uh, privileged, uh, because it has been called the most dangerous flag in computing. Uh, <laughs> I, I quite like that quote from uh, Andrew Martin from uh, from Control Play. I, I think actually that's a, a you know a, a debatable point. I'm very open to suggestions for more dangerous flags. That could be quite a fun question. So. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But let's talk about why privileged certainly is a candidate for the most dangerous flag in computing. So it was introduced for a reason. It allows Docker to run inside Docker. And that was really introduced to help developers at Docker work on Docker itself. Now, 
it's been used for other reasons like running builds. You might have exceptional reasons why you need to use it, but for the vast majority of applications, it's not really necessary. Let's talk about the things that it does, what, what's happening when you do run a container with dash dash privileged. In order to talk about this, we need to understand a little bit about Linux capabilities. So back in the mists of time, you were either root with all privileges, all privileges, or you were an unprivileged user with no special privileges. And then capabilities were added to the Linux kernel to make these permissions more granular so that you can grant or deny specific privileges. When you run a container, by default, it gets a sensible set of these capabilities, which don't include, for example, any of these three that I've um, listed here that really most containers don't need to do. Most containers don't have any reason to be modifying the kernel modules. They don't need to be changing the system time. Uh, you want to think very carefully about granting the uh, ptrace capability that lets one process trace or modify any other process. Pretty powerful capability that. So you want to restrict privileges and only grant them where they're absolutely needed. So when we run a container, we can specify the set of capabilities that are granted to that container. And to start with here in this first example, I'm running a regular Ubuntu container and I'm granting all the capabilities. And you can see that if we look at the status file for the process one inside that container, we get a value with lots and lots of Fs. It's a set of big flags and all of the flags are turned on. Then if we run the same container dropping all the capabilities, we look at the set of capabilities and all the flags are turned off, the, the values are all zero. And then if we don't specify any capabilities at all, we get that default set that I mentioned and it's kind of a mixture. So some of the flags are off, a lot of the flags are off, some of them are on. Now, if we run with dash dash privileged, it grants us all of those capabilities. So for the capabilities, it's the equivalent of adding uh, cap add all. So we've granted this container all of the possible permissions and privileges that it could have. But that isn't the end of the story. I've run the same container uh, without and with dash dash privileged, and you can see that with the privileged flag, you get access to a lot more devices. In fact, with the privileged flag, you get access to every single device on the host. And you could use that to, for example, erase partitions on the hard drives on the host. So you really, really, really don't want to have a container escape that has dash dash privileged because inside that container, you can do super dangerous things. So, Think very, very carefully before granting dash dash privileged. Now, Liz, you, you highlighted three potentially risky uh, capabilities. What, what's this, the, the worry about being able to change system time? What, where do you get into trouble if you allowed that? <laughs> yeah, so, well, at one level you might say, why should one container be able to change the time for other containers? Um, you can mess with programs pretty seriously by changing time. Um, you, uh, if you expect things to, uh, yeah, for example, if you expect to see the latest value that uh, something was set to a value, you might look for the most recent update. And if you change time in the meantime, well, how do you know what's most recent? Yeah. So it, it has serious risk to applications. It's 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 a serious risk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, and, and time is interestingly something that um, recently has started to be namespaced so that in the future, I would imagine uh, in much the same way that today you can grant a container the uh, sysboot capability and uh, it can't actually boot the whole machine anymore. It used to reboot the whole machine. Now it will just kill the container. And I would imagine that in the future, time being namespaced would mean that uh, we could grant containers the um, 
the system time capability and it wouldn't necessarily affect the rest of the system but today it's it's not something you want to really give away lightly there is one other reason why dash dash privileged is maybe sort of psychologically dangerous and that's it's it's all about the name so there's an implication that if you have a container that doesn't have dash dash privileged maybe that must means it must be unprivileged and that's really not true by default your containers do run as root you do not need the privilege flag to be running as root you can find out all about that in chapter nine in the book to, to find out more about that the point is don't give away dash dash privileged just to get root because you already have it all right uh, yeah, I see a question that out, came in. Yeah, Sorry. Uh, someone in the chat said uh, some security solutions can be affected if system time is changed as well. So, you know, if you if you knew that some some sort of antivirus or, or, or other malware detection engine was running and you could change the time, it might impact that. So that's a good point. Absolutely. All kinds of diagnostics and, and tracing and um, observability can be messed up by messing with time. Uh, there's also a question about what about running with privileged on the hosts where the Docker service itself is running with a restricted host user and not root. Okay, so I guess this is the idea that you're... So there is a new, newish idea of um, rootless containers, the ability to run containers as unprivileged users. Um, the the best sort of use case example for this is in an environment like a university where you might have a, a shared set of machines, the users are unprivileged and uh, until, re until rootless containers, if you wanted to let students run a container, well, you couldn't do that because it's, it's essentially a privileged operation. Um, rootless containers allow you to run containers as an unprivileged user. And I'm guessing that's what this question is talking about around um, if you run as an unprivileged user, if you can run a container as an unprivileged user. Um, I'm not sure whether dash dash privileged would error in that situation or whether it would carry on and try to grant you as many privileges as possible. Um, you certainly wouldn't be able to get things like all device access. And I'm not sure what would happen in terms of capabilities that you didn't already have i suspect you the kernel would prevent you from getting extra privileges but i'm not sure whether it would actually error people should definitely look into that then <laughs> before just assuming it's all safe yes it, i think it would be a bit of a weird thing to do though to have a rootless container and then run as privileged I, i'm pretty sure it will be not it won't allow you to escalate privilege or certainly if it allowed you to escalate privileges that would be a bug in my opinion <laughs> I would raise <laughs> All right, so the next question that we have is really thinking about the hosts on which your containers are running. Are you keeping your hosts up to date with the latest security releases? So let's open the next poll. Uh, this is about things like the Kubernetes software that you're running on the hosts, any uh, logging, system uh, observability, all kinds of software that you might be running on the host machines. Okay, answers are coming in. Looks like the majority of you are doing pretty well on this. But it is a big challenge to keep all of those software components up to date, right? I mean, it's uh, maybe you can keep the big pieces done, but do you even know about all the other smaller components you might be using, right? Well, well, there's a good argument for keeping your hosts running as small a set of software as you possibly can. Make sure you're right. only running uh, essential services. So just under three quarters of you are keeping up to date with the latest security releases. Um, good number of you aren't sure or know that you're not. Now, um, the reason why uh, this question kind of came to mind, uh, particularly for this presentation, was uh, 
only a couple of months ago, I got asked why our KubeBench tool doesn't support Kubernetes 1.8. Now, even at the time when I was asked this question in April, the latest release of Kubernetes was 1.18. Now, Kubernetes supports the three most recent minor versions, so 1.16, 17, and 18. 1.8 was you know, two plus years old, I think, maybe three years old. So uh, I recorded a video, I'm not going to show that now, you can, you can find that on our open source YouTube channel. Um, but I basically said, you know, you really want to be running with uh, supported software. 1.8 of Kubernetes is sufficiently out of date that it's not getting security patches. And we know there have been some significant security issues in Kubernetes since 1.8. So really, the, you know, running KubeBench, KubeBench is going to tell you if you haven't configured your Kubernetes uh, according to best practices. And uh, it doesn't really matter whether you've configured it according to best practices if you know it's full of uh, vulnerability. Well, full is an exaggeration, but if you know there are exploitable security issues in those really old versions. So I explained that in this video. I then got um, <laughs> quite a fun response from someone who uh, you know, was pointing out 1.8, shock, horror, face. And uh, clearly, he thought that I probably should have been a little bit more um, harsh, <laughs> shouty about yes. running such an old version. I will point <laughs> out this was not just a random person on the internet. This this was actually a you know a, an Aqua customer. So you know there are corporate customers, enterprise users out there who take their security seriously, but for whatever reason hadn't been taking it secure, seriously enough to upgrade their Kubernetes systems. This stuff is all important. All right, I see a couple more questions coming in. Uh, yeah, so one of them was, what, what can be done about critical vulnerabilities in your Linux kernel that might remain even after installing all the patches? Well, if there isn't a patch available, I mean, there really isn't anything, you know, you can only patch something that has a, a fix available. Um, depending on the vulnerability, there might be some other mitigating things that you could do. Uh, you, I don't know, for example, with um, turning off certain software services that maybe you would normally run, but if you decide they're not critical and they're interacting with a vulnerability um, there may be things that you can at least um, use observability tools to detect whether a problem has actually happened um, but yeah fundamentally if a patch doesn't exist you, you kind of have to wait for the fix to be released pretty rare these days that you're going to find a critical vulnerability that doesn't have a patch well there may be times too where people uh, aren't able to to patch if it's, you know, at the kernel level, it's probably more critical to do it, but even in application software, um, you know, we have the the Aqua virtual patching capability as well, which would be one, uh, you know, our vShield solution, which would at least pick up or detect and even potentially block some of those accesses. But uh, for if you're interested in that, take a look at one of our other uh, webinars. We won't go into that today. All right, and there was another question that was saying, you know, this is limited to the support of my Kubernetes distro vendor. That is absolutely true. One of the benefits of using a managed distro is, um, you know, they're collecting together all of the upgrades for you. They're maybe collecting together, um, you know, not just the Kubernetes, but maybe the maybe the distro also includes uh, observability solutions or logging or a service mesh or whatever else. Um, so hopefully they are, hopefully your vendor is applying upgrades and supplying those upgrades to you in a timely fashion, particularly for, you know, they don't happen that often, but we do occasionally see serious vulnerabilities in Kubernetes or, or other cloud native software. If they're not giving you timely patches, I would definitely call up your account manager and shout at them. <laughs> okay. So, 
now we're talking about our applications actually running live in our production cluster. And some of your application containers may need secret information like passwords or tokens so that they can do their job. Maybe your application needs a database password, for example. The poll question, do you know, are your secrets encrypted at rest and in transit? We need them to be safely encrypted wherever they are. Okay. Answers are coming in pretty fast. This one is it's just over half of you at the moment saying yes. Good, looks like a quarter of you in the no and I don't know camps. Yeah. A little bit more of a balanced response. This one is probably harder for people to, uh, to, to follow and adhere to consistently. Hmm, yeah, okay, should we close that poll? couple more people slight couple more percentage points said yes right at the last minute there um yeah so nearly half of you saying no or i'm not sure whether or not my uh secrets are encrypted at rest and in transit now i'm going to guess that most of you are using kubernetes and a good number of you will probably be using kubernetes native secrets and um, if I get a secret using Kube Control, I can just decrypt, well, it's not decrypted at all. I can get the plain text version by base64 decoding. I don't need any secret to do that. It's not encrypting, it's just uh, an encoding. There's nothing very secure about that, at least that doesn't look it. But you might be saying, yeah, but in order to run that kube control command, you have to have access to Kubernetes. You need a kube config file giving you the, the permission to access the Kubernetes API. There could also be RBAC role based access control in place to limit the set of secrets that I can actually get at. You know, hopefully, we're controlling access so that people can only get to the resources that they, they need to, and the applications can only get to the resources they need to. So there could be other controls preventing unauthorized people or applications from accessing that secret over the Kubernetes API. And that's true and that's good, but this is not the end of the story. If you're storing secrets natively in Kubernetes without any additional plugins, they're gonna be stored along with all your other state information in the etcd database by default. Now, if I go and search for my secret value inside the database, I can see that the database file matches my secret value. And I can actually look, it's a binary file, so it's not super pretty, but I can go and just look at that etcd database file, and we can see my secret is just sitting there in the clear. So anyone who has access to the database file on the host machine might be able to get at any of the secrets that are stored in there. It's, it's pretty trivial once you have access to that file. Because etcd by default is not encrypted. Now you do have options. One of your options is to encrypt etcd. You can configure it to be encrypted. Another alternative is to use a secrets manager to hold the secret values separately outside of etcd. Um, you might very well consider that most of your Kubernetes state information isn't terribly secret and that it doesn't need to be encrypted, but your secrets are another matter. So you might want to take advantage of something like uh, HashiCorp Vault or the key management systems from your cloud provider, somewhere secure that you can store those secrets. And there's lots of uh, Kubernetes integrations for secret storage. All right, we are coming up to the last question, the last poll for today. And you remember we talked earlier about treating your containers as immutable. So the question here is, can you prevent containers from drifting? Do you have a way of spotting when a container attempts to run something that wasn't in the original container image? 
and generally, okay. I guess the 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 belief here is that um, that should never happen. Is that you know the, the containers? Once you've you've built them, we don't uh, we don't want anybody running anything that was not specifically allowed in that first version, right? Correct. And if you do see something running inside a container that's uh, that wasn't in the original image. Uh, provided you're treating your containers as immutable, it's almost certainly a sign of compromise. Never uh, a good and our thing. research team have seen you know, uh, containers being compromised to run uh, cryptocurrency miners. That's the kind of classic example at the moment. And it so, looks like this is a hard one for people to solve because a lot of people haven't. And, and this is a harder problem. Uh, Essentially, you know, there, there is not much, there are some open source solutions for detecting, there are not any open source solutions that I am aware of for preventing container drift. But let me show you something that is pretty cool in Aqua. Um, so I have a demo here. I'm going to run a, a, an Ubuntu container and uh, we're going to look in the Aqua console and uh, I can see my Ubuntu image has a, a default Aqua profile associated with it. And I've set up that profile to, well, to have drift prevention turned on. Right now it's in audit only mode, but this is detecting if we try to run an executable that wasn't present in the original image. Now I'm going to create uh, an executable. I'm just going to create a short script. It's not going to do anything super fancy. And in this instance, it's going to be completely harmless, but it should show the principle. All I'm going to do is write a message to the screen with this script. Okay, so I've created that file. I need to make it, uh, give it the executable bit so that it can be run. And then I can just run that script and it writes that message to the screen. Now that is a new executable added to the container. That was not present when we scanned the image. So this is drift in action. And we can see that in the audit logs, it has been detected. Aqua has been able to spot that. You can see the security control is drift prevention. Now, if we want to take this a step further and prevent that drift from happening, we can turn on enforcement. And now if we try to run that same executable, we get permission denied error. We didn't even need to restart the container, which is pretty, pretty nice. And then we can see in the audit log that this time we've got a block uh, audit log here for the same reason for, for drift prevention. So I'm literally pressing two buttons, one to detect the drift and and then, you know, changing it to enforce. And, and now this isn't happening. Right. Yeah. And this drift prevention enforcement is it, it's probably one of the most advanced controls um, that you can that you can run for containerized security. And it's so powerful because of this concept of container drift, of immutable containers. If you treat your containers as immutable, this is like a superpower, preventing any of those unexpected attacks. If an attacker can uh, compromise your container, but then they can't actually do anything unexpected inside that container, that's super powerful. Right, you so can in conjunction- this further with, Sorry. No, I was going to say, in conjunction with one of your earlier uh, checklist items of you know, treating your own containers as if they're immutable and not adding things at runtime, and now not allowing anyone who potentially was able to make a change to a running container, which is not easy but is doable, um, you would detect that here using using this kind of capability. Absolutely. So this is kind of you know the gold standard for container security at runtime, really. All right, great. Hey. If I'll so, remind people if you have any other questions, go ahead and enter them now. Uh, we'll we'll open it up as as Liz wraps up here. We'll take some more questions at the end. Yeah. So we just talked about six 
questions. I think they are six pretty sort of interesting and important questions around the security of your deployment. Some of you may have answered no to some of these questions and that might be fine. You might have very good reasons to answer no. But if you're not sure or if you, you know, a lot of the time the sort of default best practice is a good idea. Um, so if you're not sure, maybe go and find out. Um, because there could be some things that you could do relatively straightforwardly to improve the security of your deployment. So hopefully you've already found the, uh, the download of the book. If you're watching the recording of this presentation later, you can go to info.aquasec.com and you'll find the link there with a picture of the book. So uh, uh, you should be able to find that pretty easily. Um, physical copy is also available from your favorite bookstore. With that, let's have a look at the questions that have come in. I was muted there. There's one, there's one about KubeBench. Um, uh, can you run KubeBench on a high availability Kubernetes cluster? So with one more than one master node? Uh, yes, you can. So, um, and maybe take a minute to explain what KubeBench is for some of the people on here who might not be as familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. So we mentioned it briefly earlier on. It's a tool for checking the configuration of Kubernetes and whether or not it meets best practices. Um, those best practices being defined by the Center for Internet Security. So it's a, another kind of checklist of um, configuration settings for all the different components of your uh, of your cluster. So um, I don't think in the current version of the CIS spec, I don't think there's anything specific to uh, having more than one master node, uh, but I would expect that the other tests would all apply. Um, now, QBench configuration, we could probably spend a whole other webinar talking about all the different things you can do with KubeBench for configuration um, because you can uh, you could modify the tests if you felt that was appropriate for your uh, situation. KubeBench will try to auto detect the kind of node that it's running on so a master or a, a worker node. Um, in the most recent version there are different uh, sections of tests for things like whether or not it's running etcd. Again it will attempt to auto detect that the auto detection does rely on being able to execute things like cube control or cube bench, which have to be mounted into the path from the host. So there is some configuration there. We have some example jobs, uh, job YAML that can help, but that probably don't cover every single possible scenario. Um, I would very much expect that it's possible to run cube bench in a high availability cluster. And if you find specific problems there, then please do raise them on GitHub and we'll try and help you out. All right, I mean, is this a good opportunity actually to talk about uh, your latest news out of your open source team uh, in terms of the Starboard project? And as a way uh, to yes. monitor KubeBench. Yes. And... So I'm just looking at the, there's a lot of questions as well. Wow. Okay. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. Yes. So Starboard um, is our latest project from my team, the open source team at Aqua. And the idea of Starboard is to take the output from different security reports, KubeBench being an example. I mentioned Trivi vulnerability scanning, Aqua vulnerability scanning, um, other, in also uh, reports from third party security tools. We have a, an integration with Polaris um, from Fairwinds, which uh, audits your pod spec YAML. Anyway, we take all this security information and store it in the form of Kubernetes custom resource definitions. And then that way it's accessible over the Kubernetes API. And with uh, an Octan plugin, you can see the security information right next to the Kubernetes resources that it applies to. So that's uh, much more convenient for retrieving for people who are used to tools like Kube Control or who are used to things like the Octant dashboard. All right. Um, 
So I see a question there about how about securing Fargate containers or Azure container instances? Yes, so the interesting thing about Fargate and container instances is that you don't have access to the host. So some of the things that we've talked about today, things like uh, updating the software on your host, well, you don't have control over that. That's something you have to uh, rely on the cloud provider to do. Um, if you, some of the other security controls still apply, so things like uh, vulnerability scanning still applies, and uh, things like the drift prevention that we just looked at, that is supported by the Aqua product, so you can run that kind of security in these environments like Fargate and ACI. Okay. There's another question here, you know, looking at drift prevention and um, obviously the, the control that's in place for that, but someone was saying, wouldn't the change in the size of the container image be detected as well? Why, you know, why do I need to do drift prevention in real time? And I guess the, you know, that, you know, is, is that something you know, that you would be able to block in real time? What, well, based on the size? Yes. So one of the interesting things about uh, container immutability is that there are perfectly legitimate reasons why additional files might get written into a container. You, you might have a process that writes some temporary state to a file that it's just going to have running locally inside the it's just going to store inside its own file system. Um, so that would affect the size of the running container instance, um, but it wouldn't necessarily be executable. And it's really only execution that you care about. Um, you care about uh, an attacker getting into a container, um, actually executing something inside that container. They have to be able to execute something in order to um, extract information. And if you can prevent them from running those executables, then uh, you kind of won the battle. So actual file, uh, file size is not really, not necessarily a, a strong indicator of, of compromise. Okay. All right, great. Um, there's a ton of questions here. I know, yeah, we, we will get back to all of them. If you want to grab one or two more. I would, I would, uh, love, I would like to answer as many as we can get through. Uh, okay, let's spend you know, let's, let's a couple more live and then we'll wrap up and uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. <laughs> there's a question here. It, it basically just says binary authorization. Um, so this is also known as um, well, it, it's part of something that we can call image assurance. So uh, we also can think of it as admission control. So the idea that before you run a container, you can make some kind of policy checks on the container image and its configuration and decide whether or not it's safe to run. So yeah, there's lots of different um, approaches for doing that. There's things like OPA and Gatekeeper in the open source world. Uh, binary authorization is, I think it's Google's own term. It's certainly, they, they talk about bin auths in, in GKE. Um, yeah, and tools like Aqua have very flexible um, policy configuration so that you can do things like only run a, only allow containers to run you know, if they meet a certain set of criteria and um, uh, you can either prevent or alert on uh, failure to meet those policies. So is that related to, there's a question here about uh, using image signatures for container integrity. Is that something you cover in the book? Is that a new development? Um, and how does that relate to what you're talking about with there's yeah, so um, it, it relates to what we talked about around um, immutability. Um, in order to detect whether or not an execute, in fact, you know, the, the demo that we just showed there that the um, a new executable had been added, the Aqua solution is sophisticated enough to fingerprint the different executables so that you can't just 
if I'd renamed that script to, I don't know, LS or something, or if I'd overwritten a uh, permitted executable, it would have detected that it wasn't the same. Uh, the original the binary one. was different. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is there one more question you want to take right now? And then, uh, as I said, if, for those of you, if we didn't get to your question, we will uh, uh, make sure we answer via email. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to, have to be writing a lot of uh, 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 a lot of questions. Okay, uh, one question here: Does Keybench have support for scenario where etcd is in a separate node than the master node? Yes, the most recent version of the uh, CIS Kubernetes benchmark uh, has a separate section for etcd, and we do run that as a separate uh, section. So yes, we can we can. We have that support. All right, great. <laughs> so I'll take this opportunity to thank you, Liz, for sharing the insights into your book. Well, thank you for writing the book, and everybody can get a copy of that. Um, uh, as, as we said, either from the handouts before you leave today on the handouts panel, or um, online from from uh, aquasec.com. You can you can download it from there and. Uh, but we appreciate you taking the time to take people through some, this is just some of the checklist items uh, that that are covered in the book. And there's obviously a lot more depth on each of these in, uh, in the various chapters. So uh, thank you again for sharing, with it, uh, sharing, sharing that with us today. There are a couple of other things for those of you on the webinar who are looking for a next level even beyond container security and just continuing your um, evolution here. If we could go to the next slide, we'll share a couple of other resources that uh, you could be looking at here. Who has slides? Oh, yes. um, <laughs> yeah. 